Hello, I'm John Schneider, and welcome to Jersey Bayshore Country. Just checking the music for a documentary that I'm working on, which you're now looking at, hopefully, on the history of Sandy Hook. It's one of the most complicated documentaries I've ever done. Uh, usually it takes me a couple of weeks to do a fairly decent documentary about some aspect of our history here in Jersey Bayshore country. But Sandy Hook, Sandy Hook, New Jersey, which is a spit that uh, is surrounded by water, uh, is complicated because the history is multi-layered. There are so many aspects from the very beginning of time, 65 million years ago during the Cretaceous period, when the spit of the peninsula was being formed, to uh, when it was discovered, uh, presumably by Henry Hudson, who sailed the half moon into Sandy Hook Bay and uh, ran into the Lenny Lenape Native Americans, and uh, they, uh, they killed one of his uh, sailors, uh, arrow through the neck. And then, of course, the lighthouse and uh, Fort Hancock and the Sandy Hook Proving Ground. And, oh, let's even say the nude beach is part of the history. And all of the stuff that you can do at Sandy Hook today makes this documentary a complicated story. So why don't we get started? You're looking at part of the Jersey Bay Shore. Sandy Hook is over there, and technically it's part of Middletown, New Jersey, and here's the bridge which crosses over to Sandy Hook from Highlands. The Shrewsbury River is on the western side of the Hook, while the Atlantic Ocean dominates in the east. This seven and a half mile spit of land, or peninsula as some call it, has been important for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Now witness to the history and evolution of Sandy Hook is the small clamming village of Highlands, which has been across the Shrewsbury River from Sandy Hook for quite a while. In part, this series has been a challenge because I have so much information in my head. Thanks to fellow historians and friends like Tom Hoffman, Sandy Hook historian, Sean Welsh and Tom Minton of the Army Ground Forces Association, Mark Stewart of the Twin Lights Foundation, author and friend Robert Mayers, who really understands the Revolutionary War, Monmouth County historian Randall Gabriellen, John Corbett, veteran of the Navasink Military Reservation, Bill Jackson, veteran of the Nike missile installation on Sandy Hook. Thanks to everyone who provided historic photographs, especially my friend Les Horner. Thanks as well to the National Park Service, Monmouth County Park System, and the Monmouth Battlefield State Park. And finally, thanks to Corey Newman, a friend who seems to know everything about military history. I'm sorry if I miss somebody. Some of these folks will join me in narrating this story of Sandy Hook. So let me cut to the chase and start telling you what I know. I know that when I first went to this glorious place, I felt something tug at me, and it wasn't the tides on all sides. When the entire army presence and importance on this piece of property evolved into what's left today as relics, it amazes me to think how the role of Sandy Hook has changed as often as the sand that makes up Sandy Hook. Its shape has changed and now its future is changing. But for me, the most important aspect of this program's message is how much more meaningful life can become for those who choose to dig deeper 
and try to understand what really happened at Sandy Hook during some of the most important periods of our history. Sandy Hook is an amazing place with an amazing story to be told. Today, most of the 1,665 acres of Sandy Hook is owned and managed by the National Park Service as the Sandy Hook unit of Gateway National Recreation Area. And there are relics from our past lying in the sand, hidden behind the trees, and sometimes off limits to the public. What you see in this video is not to be disturbed or taken. It's a living museum, and we should all be respectful of every rusted piece of metal or broken piece of concrete. It is, after all, a federal offense to deface or remove anything from the peninsula. If you have to take something, take photographs. Thanks. Incidentally, the northwest area of Fort Hancock is under the control of the United States Coast Guard, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security and definitely off limits to the public. It was Giovanni da Verrazzano who was the first official European to explore the Atlantic coast of North America, eventually making his way into our bays by 1524. Soon thereafter, a few maps were created to help guide the way. But Henry Hudson, when he discovered Sandy Hook, came around 1609. And for some reason, the Dutch came here in droves. In fact, Sandy Hook, Sand Hook, is Dutch and means spit of land. By 1614, the population of immigrants who came to live in the New World was a whopping 300 people. I'm talking about in all of America. And virtually no one lived here in the Jersey Bay Shore except the Lenape Indians. So today, remember it's 1614, a group of Dutch traders are coming to Raritan Bay for the very first time to trade with the Lenape Indians. And here's what they probably saw. Waiting for some sign that the, the new world is just ahead. A bird, a seagull, another ship perhaps. And they waited, and they sailed, and they thought they were headed in the right direction when suddenly they heard a seagull. And they knew that in just a matter of hours or minutes, they would see the new world, new possibilities for trade. They might all be rich as a result. And then, there it was, they sounded the ship's bell. Everybody rushed out to take a look at this new world, this new opportunity for all of them. They saw Sandy Hook, they saw the white sandy beaches. They saw the birds flying. They saw the blue sky and the white fluffy clouds and they said, my gosh, we've made it. We made it to the new world. It must have been an exciting time, sailing past the tip of Sandy Hook into Raritan Bay for the first time. Hills on the right, Staten Island. Hills on the left, the Highlands. And then they would drop anchor. And they would explore this new world for the first time. Fresh beaches untouched by human footprints. 
clear springs and water, forests and hills. They got out of their boat and they explored, of course. What a world this was. What a place. Now, while the Dutch continued to trade and settle in this area for the next 50 years, the British eventually took control and called the area Hortland. Almost immediately, Richard Hartshorn became one of the first British settlers by purchasing a large tract of land from the Lenapes and calling it Hortland Point. So there were three villages in all that were established. The short-lived Portland Point, which was located near Highlands, Atlantic Highlands, and included Sandy Hook. Shrewsbury was the second village, which was south of the Navasink River. And the third village was Middletown, which was generally located between the two other villages in the middle, so to speak. And so the land and waterways were claimed for the purposes of planting crops, obtaining lumber for building homes and businesses, and of course, fishing. And the Jersey Bay Shore began its journey into the future thanks to those who had the courage to cross the ocean and set foot on this new and sometimes dangerous land. Needless to say, there was an influx of immigrants. And unfortunately, some of them were shipwrecked just as they were arriving. So by 1764, the colony of New York, as it was called, built a lighthouse so that ships could sail safely into New York Harbor. It was originally called New York Lighthouse because it was funded through a New York Assembly lottery, as well as a tax on all ships entering the Port of New York. A lot of people don't realize because they see the ships coming in and out of New York Harbor just going straight in, up until relatively recently, that was not a deep water approach. The safest way into New York Harbor, the deepest channel, uh, required uh, uh, boats to come right at the Jersey Shore, right at Sandy Hook, and then make a hard right into New York Harbor. So you can imagine, especially in the day of sailing ships, uh, in a storm, if you miss that turn, if you didn't know exactly where you were, you would end up on the sandbars out here, and there's hundreds of wrecks out there. You know, it's, it's amazing to me that this lighthouse has endured all of these years, even after an occupation by British troops during the Revolutionary War. It still stands. This lighthouse is truly, I believe, the soul of Sandy Hook, and it's always the best place to start the story because it also offers the best 360-degree view in the area. Here's my friend and author, Bob Mayers, followed by Thomas Minton, who both know a thing or two about this place. Of all the areas in the whole 13 colonies, the one that was occupied by British forces for the longest time was Sandy Hook. And they came in here in 1775. If you held Sandy Hook, you controlled New York Harbor. And that's why they put the light the house there and much earlier than the war, but that, that was there during the war. It was British held during the war. Prior to our Declaration of Independence in July of 1776, Continental artillerymen made an attempt to destroy the lighthouse with artillery fire to prevent the British from using it. Um, an officer, a, a Boston Continental Army officer by the name of Colonel Tupper, went over and took his cannons with him and fired on the lighthouse and fired and fired and fired for several hours, but he couldn't penetrate him. His cannons weren't big enough. They were too light to do any dim, and he finally withdrew. The British Navy immediately seized the Sandy Hook Peninsula and put up a guard around the lighthouse and fortified the area. This allowed the Sandy Hook Lighthouse to remain in British hands for the duration of the conflict. It gave safe passage to all the British vessels entering or leaving New York Harbor, allowing the British to operate in that area without restriction. The Sandy Hook Lighthouse also plays a unique part in one of the, one of the largest battles in the American Revolutionary War. In June of 1778, as the British withdraw from the city of Philadelphia, they are making their way across the state of New Jersey, heading for New York. Their destination, however, 
is Sandy Hook, where they will embark on ships and go up into the city. General Washington has been training his soldiers all winter long, and he pursues the British as they cross the state of New Jersey, and they engage one another at Monmouth Courthouse on June 28, 1778. The battle's toll has been heavy. Over 700 men are killed, wounded, or missing. Almost as many soldiers have died of heat and dehydration as have died from battle wounds. The battle uh, stopped, the combatants stopped fighting. Uh, the uh, British faded away during the night. Their goal was to get their troops to New York. They didn't want to win a battle, they didn't want to engage in a battle but they wanted to rejoin the rest of the British Army, which was in New York City, and they were, of course, coming up from Philadelphia. Here we have a wagon train. It was 12 miles long, and uh, it had uh, anywhere from 12,000 to 20,000 British troops, uh, camp followers, suppliers of the army, and a whole retinue of Tories, which were the loyalists to the British side. And they were all coming, they all left Philadelphia, they had cannons, wagons, and they were on their way to New York. They headed out here to Sandy Hook. Uh, the thought was to have ships come out here and pick them up and evacuate them to New York. Why didn't Washington pursue them? Well, there were a couple of reasons for that. One is that his troops were tired, they had fought all day, they had done well, and he wanted to quit while he was ahead and he wanted to head up for New, New Brunswick and preserve the Continental Army. He was afraid to take him into another battle and, uh, and they would be annihilated. And another reason was that this whole Bayshore area was teeming with Tories, loyalists, and they were afraid they would meet a hostile civilian population if they came on in here. As you drive down the main road toward the lighthouse, look for this historic marker, which reminds us the British were here. What's also nearby is a memorial for some of the crew of a British ship that was moored in the bay, and they tried to desert the ship as it was anchored. The men became lost in the salt marshes of Sandy Hook during a blizzard, and they all perished. Their remains were discovered in 1908. Here's Bob Mayers again with an unusual story about a small town of refugees who lived on Sandy Hook close to the end and immediately after the Revolutionary War. Let me tell you about a very interesting guy not too many people know about. He was an African American and he was an escaped slave from Shrewsbury. And he gathered around him, and he was pro-British, he gathered around him a very large number of uh, a, a black Americans plus um, plus some white white uh, loyalists, and they settled over on Sandy Hook, and they had a town over there. It was a rev refugee town, and it had up to maybe a hundred people. It was it was right at a few hundred yards from the lighthouse. He conducted raids against the Patriots in the Bayshore area and all the way inland. He penetrated inland to Tinton Falls with his raiders. He was one of the most prominent uh, leaders, colorful leaders of the whole American Revolution, Colonel Ty, his name was. In three years' time, General Washington will defeat the British in Yorktown, Virginia, ending the war. The American dream of liberty will finally be realized, purchased in part with the lives, blood, and devotion of soldiers who once fought valiantly here on the fields of farmers at a place called Mon. And once the peace treaties have been signed and the British evacuate North America, all the Tories load up with them, they embark, and they sail home to England. They have to give up everything that they had worked for. But for the entire American Revolution, they were refugees out at Sandy Hook underneath the lighthouse. Most people th think the war ended in, uh, in Yorktown on October 17, 1881. It didn't. It ended in 1783. And during the, in 1782, 1783, there was the Treaty of Paris being negotiated and hostilities were way down, but not here. They kept it up. Uh, the militia and the patriots were retaliating against all their loyalist neighbors. They were killing them and uh, uh, it was just a lot. They, and they were, they were taking their property. Uh, they were shipping them off. Uh, and it went on till 1783, which is, which is rather rare because uh, after Washington disbanded the army, the Continental Army in 1782, so it was pretty much over, but not here. 
During the War of 1812, which had us fighting the British once more, Fort Gates was established on Sandy Hook, and two years later, the War Department, as it was called back in those days, purchased Sandy Hook. Very little is really happening out at Sandy Hook in 1814 through 1859. Why is that? Well, the Army hadn't decided yet what they wanted to do. So when the troops came out to Fort Hancock, or what we knew then as the Sandy Hook Military Reservation, they came out in a temporary manner. They would erect tents, they would erect wooden buildings, only for the purpose of housing and, and maintaining themselves while they were there with an understanding that they were only there for a short period of time. Strangely, it took almost 50 years to construct something permanent. The fortification was designed by young Robert E. Lee. He was a lieutenant at the time. And believe it or not, the fort that he designed was never completed. By the time it was ready to be used, the technology of the day had grown faster than the fort's capabilities. It was like an old-time fort with large blocks of white granite, fixed cannons which couldn't be easily moved. And just like an old fort, everybody had to stay inside the so-called castle because that's what it looked like, a castle. There are only a few photographs of the structure and you're looking at them. See, the army tore the castle down, but today you can still see part of the white granite wall beneath the water tower inside the guarded property of the United States Coast Guard. The lighthouse on Sandy Hook was not enough to prevent serious catastrophes at sea or, or shipwrecks. So in 1823, Sandy Hook was supplemented by the Sandy Hook Lightship, stationed in Sandy Hook Channel, about three miles offshore. It still wasn't enough to protect all of the ships, which were now regularly flowing into the harbor. Because of its prominent location, there are many other federal agencies and groups that were out there. The U.S. Weather Bureau, Western Union, because they would be looking for all the ships coming into, into the harbor, what, uh, what goods they were carrying, so they could alert everybody up in the harbor what was coming in. The U what we now know as the U.S. Life Saving Service also began in part on the Sandy Hook Peninsula in 1848. There were eight federally funded life-saving stations built that year. Number one was at Fort Hancock, was at Sandy Hook, present-day Fort Hancock. It was a small one-story uh, cedar shake building, and it still exists today as part of the Twin Lights State Historic Site up in the Highlands. Over time, that became the U.S. Life-Saving Service. There was another station built there in the 1870s, and the current present day station was built in 1894. And that was the, for, the, for a very long time, was the, fort, was the National Park Service Visitor Center at Fort Hancock National Historic Landmark. So the nation's shipping industry asked Congress to build another temporary lighthouse on the highlands of New Jersey. And the Navasink Light Station was born in 1828, but not the stone towers which we see today. By 1862, the new Twin Lights became operational. Here's Mark Stewart of the Twin Lights Foundation explaining how the Twin Lights are connected to the Sandy Hook Life Saving Station. One of the national treasures we have up here, which is maybe our next goal in terms of interpreting our history up here, is uh, an unassuming little building that happens to be the very first, physically the very first life saving station in the United States. Wow. Very few people know it's here. It was out on Sandy Hook when hmm. they established the uh, U.S. Life Saving Service in the 1840s. They built every few miles a life saving station, which uh, initially just housed equipment. And if there was a shipwreck, the, the life saving people would run in there and get what they needed to, to try and rescue the people off the ship, usually when they ran aground on the sandbars out there. Um, the, fact that, the fact that it still exists it's just a remarkable thing. I mean, if just think about Hurricane Sandy. What year are we talking about? 1840s. Generally? Uh, it was something that was out on Sandy Hook. It was moved around a little while. They moved it to Highlands briefly, but no one really wanted this thing. Hmm. Uh, so we took it up here, and I say we, this is probably 50 or 60 years ago, just to keep it safe. And it was like a, a time capsule of life saving equipment. Wow. There was unbelievable stuff in there, including a couple of Francis Life cars. Uh, one is a prototype and one is, you know, one of the originals. These are the things where they would ferry uh, passengers back uh, from uh, ships that had run aground. Uh, they'd shoot a big wire with a uh, breeches It was like a big giant buoy. rocket ship, wasn't it? The self-contained? Is that the thing that's out in the power station? Yeah, we have, one, we have one here and yeah. uh, we have another one that we lend out to other museums. And 
uh, if you were on a ship that hit, uh, that ran aground, it's not like you just got stuck in the mud in a car. If your ship ran aground on a sandbar, every time there was a wave, it would go up, boom, and come down. So if you were a passenger on that ship, it must have been a terrifying experience. Whether you could swim or not made very little difference because you were in a storm and it was just hammering you up and down and yep. up and yep. down. And um, uh, starting in the 1850s, they would start. They would uh, come to the the life-saving crews would come to the water, uh, water's edge, and shoot a line that the people on the ship would wrap around a mast, and then mm -hmm. they would take this life car back and forth, wow. seven, eight, nine people at a time. Wow. Um, and what's interesting is, here's the technology that someone came up with, and usually when you have a life-saving technology and you try it out for the first time, something horrible happens. Mm. In this case, the first time they used it, which is really amazing, uh, the only person who died was someone who didn't want to wait for the next lifeguard because his family was inside, and he said, you know what? I'll go on top and I'll just hang on. Sure. He was the sure. only person who died. Everyone else made it off the ship. My gosh. Uh, so it was one of those few contraptions back in the uh, 19th century that worked exactly as planned the first time. I think a lot of people know there was a military base on Sandy Hook. That's sort of obvious. And some other folks see some of the big guns aimed out toward the ocean. There are two of them that still stand. And even fewer see the crumbled remains of concrete artillery bunkers. But hardly anyone completely understands the enormity of work done by the Sandy Hook Proving Grounds. It's an amazing story all by itself. Now let's move the camera to the left a little bit and you'll see the original firing range and the lighthouse off in the distance. Also, do you see the wooden planks which were connected together to be roads? Yeah, <laughs> very primitive stuff. I mean, barely electricity. So all kinds of guns, small and large, were being tested at the Sandy Hook Proving Ground. These included handguns and rifles, as well as machine guns and small field cannons, and of course the very large seacoast defense cannons. Now there are three basic components to the proof battery. There's the firing line where the guns are mounted and tested. There's the gun park, as they called it, adjacent to the firing line where they stored the guns waiting to be tested. And there was the firing range where the projectiles landed after being fired. Thank you.